the culture to develop leaders, they always, it's the first thing they say, I just don't have enough time for that. Every time I tried to do a leader development, and I did every six months as a brigade commander, a, a E7 and above leader development event to get at some of the challenging issues, uh, sure enough, it was always a fight with tremendous battalion commanders. I just don't have time, sir. I don't have time. Afterwards, you're glad you did it. And when we deployed, we all realized, <laughs> wish we'd have done even more. And I thought we did a heck of a lot. So we got to look at leader development. And, uh, it's positive we're doing it, but with the op tempo, it's tough to, uh, to do enough of it. And, of course, the schoolhouse at every level has the challenge of how do you challenge uh, from a brand-new soldier coming in uh, who, you know, of course, we all come in from different backgrounds, from different for different reasons, and how do you inculcate those values pretty quickly because what do you do uh, wh when that individual is going right to a unit that's deployed again in the, in the construct, and how do you get them up to speed pretty quickly? I'll give you a couple of examples uh, just on the ground. Uh, there's a thousand, obviously, to choose from, and I just wanted to give a couple to, again, for the positives of uh, the ethical standards and, and, our, and uh, our, our role as a, as a profession. You know, I had a battalion commander was uh, right prior to elections in 05, and, uh, uh, and, and they, were, they were really uh, in, in a tough fight in western Mosul, and he was uh, chasing some guys who had just beheaded uh, some of the election uh, workers who had put up campaign posters, and they beheaded them as an example. So they were chasing these guys pretty intense and uh, in a very crowded industrial area. Uh, one of these insurgents that had done it had hidden in an alley, and as battalion commander with the security force was running down this alley, he opened up and shot the battalion commander three times. Uh, his sergeant major went in and hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat uh, uh, brought the insurgent out who'd done it, and you know he was in pretty bad shape. Uh, what other army would, of course, evacuate both of them, the same standard, and then put the insurgent who just shot the battalion commander, who was beloved by his men, put him in surgery first because he wouldn't make it if we didn't. What other army in the world would do that? What other, you know, that's, that's a profession you can be proud of, ethics and standards above uh, the enemy who would, as we all know, would have tortured our guys and left them there to die. And uh, we, we can never lower ourselves. And, and just one example, uh, you know, seeing an E4 and E5 just last year in Iraq as a DCG, uh, as we partnered more, seeing young E4s and young, young E5s uh, setting the standard with the Iraqi army where they were treating civilians poorly. I mean, not, not anything, uh, you know, bad, but not, not as they should. And, and treating detainees not up to the proper standard. It didn't take a first sergeant, didn't take a battalion commander, company commander, young E-4s and E-5s correcting them, showing them the right way, teaching them the profession of arms. Pretty incredible, especially on the pace. Most of these guys, I'm talking about three or four deployments. You know, this isn't like, you know, one time they go and uh, there, there's a whole bunch. And then uh, just incredible constraint when you look at around crowds and, the, you know, when I, I'm jumping to the, the negatives out there now, but the constraint, the positives, the constraint when, you know, one of the negatives is this enemy watches and, of course, they use our ethical standards against us, obviously. I mean, uh, they... You know, the, the very way they are getting after us, blending in with the civilian population, uh, using 10, 12-year-old children to throw hand grenades, hiding behind crowds of women and children, uh, doing horrible things like killing women and children and, uh, and using them as uh, decoys and, uh, you know, bring the parents in, uh, come, uh, driving up to a hospital with blood, fake blood on them. Doctors and nurses run out and they, they blow up the vehicle and kill everybody, but they use our ethical standards against us. So, uh, you know, it's, it's of course we're never going to lower ourselves and we're going to maintain our ethical standards of what is, it's, it's critical to the professional arm, it's critical to us, but boy, do we have to incorporate it in our training because they're going to use it and they're going to use it every way possible. And if, again, if we're not doing that tough, realistic training with those dilemmas in there, uh, they're, they're not going to react properly when, when put in harm's way, and, and shame on us uh, for doing that. And, and uh, you know, that culture of we've got to embed that culture, which I think is there, obviously always needs to work, and you can never take it for granted, but that culture that you can never lower your standards, and you must set the example and rise above all, uh, as soldiers see these horrible things happening, that they would never lower their standards to get back or get revenge or anything. And you, you don't see that very much, thank God, because it's, it's in the... Uh, it's in the culture, but it has to be worked on constantly. Uh, and then, uh, 
you know, again, just getting back to the, the issues where I saw there were ethical dilemmas uh, in combat, all were rapid situations where folks were, you know, I think of a young staff sergeant in combat for the very first time uh, in, a, in an ambush, very tough situation, and uh, the dilemma of, of, uh, of what to do with a wounded enemy he was trying to evacuate and, and not doing the right thing, not making that decision. Uh, and, and I look back and you, you, you just say, did we train him uh, as hard as we could? Yeah. Did we give him scenarios like that? Boy, we tried, but I don't, no, I don't, think, we, I don't think we gave him the right scenarios. And you've got to really look and, and uh, almost red team it, if you will, the way we red team our orders and so forth of in training. Are we giving them the scenarios they're gonna face so, so that guy doesn't face that for the first time in combat? on one of the first missions. Uh, and then also I will tell you, uh, this is a tough one to talk about, uh, but General Kazan and I saw it and it shocked me, uh, the, the lack of ethical standards at some of the senior levels that I saw that we never thought would be there. We, we did train, we had Sean come down and, and help train in a division and, uh, and I saw it in, in uh, both, both years in different levels you know, from E8s and above, E05s and above, infidelity, fraternization issues. You know, and some will say, well, it's the pressure, or it's the constant deployments. You know, you, we, as a profession, we can never accept any, and, and so again, I look and I say, did we cover, did we really talk about that as much as we could? Did we use examples? Sometimes I think we bury those senior examples and don't talk about them enough where we can learn from them. Uh, I'm not sure we truly learned from them and, you know, I, I can't accept that they're going to happen anyway or they're going to happen after nine years of persistent conf conflict. None of us can accept that. That tears away from what Dr. Snyder was talking about, what General Franks was talking about. That tears a profession of arms, tears us away in the, the harm that it does. You know, I look at, I talk 99.99% do the right thing, but boy, when there is something that's done wrong, I think how we address it is so critical that we learn from it and how we get out there quickly, uh, you know, admitting we did something wrong and, and making sure it's known that we won't do it again and it's, it, it is uh, an anomaly and it's something we'll police, as was mentioned earlier, professions police themselves. I think of Abu Ghraib, you know, I was there after that, but I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind, I'm positive, I lost soldiers based on the recruiting on the internet and the, the uh, uh, extremists recruiting from what happened at Abu Ghraib, no question in my mind. I had soldiers who lost their lives because others did not maintain ethical standards and that, that hurts. And uh, you know, if we look at it that way as we're, as we're incorporating into training, I think we'll put more effort into that. And I applaud the leveraging of technology. We had a real lack of, uh, you know, this younger generation learns through technology better than any of us old fogies do. And, uh, and we had a real lack of it for a while. We started uh, back in 2002, the, uh, there was some interactive uh, 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 ethical dilemma uh, uh, games, if you will, being created, but we, ca we lost funding, we got away from it. We're back to it with the uh, Im uh, immersive learning DVDs. I applaud that. I think we need to expand it. We need to look at it. It's not cheap, but uh, we've got the expertise out there to do, th do things like create apps on iPhones. You want to get these folks, you know, using stuff, make it an app on an iPhone, they're going to use it, and, and get the ethical dilemmas in there, get the scenarios in there that we can do. Uh, let's be creative about how we get the younger folks involved and, I, and that doesn't mean that, you know, as I go back to uh, that, that making them have a mandatory reading program, some of those things are, are bad and gone. It's just me. They may, they may be reading it on their iPad. They may be reading it on their Kindle. That's okay, but, uh, but we got to maintain some of those. But we got to also get creative about how we do it and get some of those forums out there where, you know, this gen these folks, what, what my, my experience is the younger generation, they, although sometimes we don't think it, they want to communicate more uh, than we did just in a different way. Any of you have kids, you know, my, my daughters amaze me with, uh, you know, 10,000 texts and, and tweets uh, a day. You know, it's like sometimes I'm like, don't you ever want to just call somebody and talk to them or go over and talk to them face to face? It's just not how they do business. So we got to adapt to that and come up with ways to, to train and teach them that are uh, creative and, and get into that. So, uh, and then, you know, uh, I mentioned the, uh, it, it's tough in the, in the schools, everyone comes in uh, in the schoolhouse particular with the limited resources and everyone comes in with different and, and so quickly you got to get folks up to speed so when they do come and and are replacements in a unit where you may never have seen them uh, to, to get them up to speed and training in your unit but they show up uh, what do you do and how do you 
uh, what tools could we provide and how can we assist in making sure their ethical standards are up to speed. Uh, and I also think, of course, with the uh, media, uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, there, there are ethical standards there that, you know, I found myself uh, very frustrated with reporters uh, that, you know, I, I didn't want all positive. I just wanted the good, the bad, and the ugly. I wanted balance. Uh, and it seemed like over and over again it was, it, and I understand they've got to sell papers, they've got to uh, capture news, and you know, you could have 15 great things happen, but one car bomb goes off and nobody's even hurt, and that's the headline. Okay, part of that's our fault, I believe, and, and we've got to do better at it, and, and we've got to find ways and, and stop with the excuses. And, and then also, I believe our portrayal of the military, some services uh, do it better than, than the Army, and I think we've got to do a better job of how we're portrayed. And you know, you look at a movie like uh, We Were Soldiers, and all of us in the profession of arms look at that and see it as incredibly realistic. It, it makes you have incredible pride, and, and it uh, makes you proud. The critics said, oh, how corny and unrealistic, because they didn't understand it. And, and people see us mostly portrayed in the robotic, uh, you know, foolish, the generals in there playing with the, the Army guys and making dumb decisions, and, uh, and, and uh, the leaders aren't creative, and th that agile leader mindset I talked about would never be portrayed. What well, should be, and maybe we need to be more proactive about going out there and and trying to get those type and, and how we can improve on that, so we get a more accurate picture of the incredible young men and women that are out there and what what they're doing. And then things like the final thing in ethical, it still still hits ethical standards. Uh, and when you look at risk assessments and and things like 15-6s, I think you can see. I saw and watching about 12 brigades o over the last uh, year and and in the prep, uh, you know, throughout a whole area and brigades rotating. You know, when, when you can tell pretty quickly when, a, when those things are check the block mentality uh, just to, to get at the standards or when they are uh, part of the culture of the unit of something that is done to save lives and, you know, a 15-6 can, can be handled many, many ways. And when it's a culture of, look, this is to protect you. So three years from now when someone makes a claim about something, we have what accurately happened on the ground. This is not an I gotcha or a risk assessment is not a covering your butt this is because it's the right thing to do because you're going to find something that saves a soldier's life and we've got to do it. And so the culture in the organization and, the, and that gets at those ethical standards of, uh, you know, that you do capture it accurately. Final example of uh, negative uh, that just show you kind of, again, when you look at things uh, sometimes uh, uh, from the, from the uh, hindsight is 2020, had a young company commander, a great company commander, uh, this, this very experienced prior service company commander in Iraq when I was a brigade commander. And uh, he was doing tremendous things. He, he uh, turned an entire, an area that was a uh, uh, insurgent leader stronghold, uh, totally intimidated. And he turned them around. He turned the population around and did an incredible job. But passion got the best of him uh, when uh, a striker vehicle was moving in restricted terrain. There were some private Iraqi security guards at an oil facility. Uh, and they were en route chasing an IED uh, maker that they saw in the vehicle, and the guards wouldn't let them through a gate. They stopped them, and it was very restrictive terrain. The company commander went, popped, you know, got out of his striker and went back to get on the radio to uh, hire and tell them the situation. Meanwhile, the strikers moved back in this restrictive terrain where these guards were overwatching the whole time, so they knew what was going on, and a very large underbelly IED exploded on the company commander's striker. His uh, gunner of 18 months was ejected, uh, lost his legs. The company commander got back there pretty quickly, of course. And uh, as these guys who were watching all this and were a part of all this, obviously, were being brought back, emotions got the best of me. Took the bloody boot from his, uh, his soldier he loved so much and uh, who was already uh, medevac, and, and he would, would live, thank God. But uh, the company commander was overcome with emotions and took that bloody boot and struck one of the detainees in front of his soldiers, struck him in the face um, and just said, you knew about this and you know, th that's all he did and they, they went off, that's all he did. I mean, it's bad, it's wrong, but that's all he did in the moment of passion, uh, you know, tough situation. But ethically what he did wrong then, he didn't tell anybody. You know, uh, he just tried to kind of hide it. And he was embarrassed and never really sure why he didn't. He was a great young man, great young leader. But he didn't tell anybody and of course a couple weeks later we found out it's, it's going to come out, you know, obviously, and, and uh, did a 15-6 and so forth. And, but so, you know, when you look back at that and you, you sit, sit back when you're all comfortable and say, oh, geez, how could he do that? That's it. But, but when you're in the heat of that moment, 
it's pretty darn tough. These are tough, tough uh, situations that these young men and women are going through. Uh, and I'm not saying they weren't tough before in other wars. Of course they were, uh, but they're, they're very tough uh, now, and I think getting tougher because others are watching and going to learn from this. So, uh, you know, part of the profession of arms, those ethical standards are so critical. Uh, we've got a ways to go. Thank goodness we're doing it right 99.99% of the time, but it's got to be 100%. We've got to get there and uh, how we train, how we prepare. Uh, thinking about it, talking about it, this campaign, all that's been talked about here today is going to get us there. And, I, I, again, I'm just humbled to be a part of this panel and to give a small view. And, uh, and thanks very much for, for allowing me to, to give you those examples. Our uh, last speaker will be Colonel Walt Pyde. Um, we are going to have to keep remarks brief to our word. We want to make sure everybody has a, an opportunity to leave here at noon. Uh, most of the panel members will remain, though, until approximately around 1220. So if you would like to continue to stay and ask questions, we'll be here available to you at that time. I know many have to go to lunch, though, uh, around that time. So, uh, Walt, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks. I, I will be able to keep it brief because uh, I just want to use an example of when I learned, uh, you know, the importance of you know, our morals and our values in this complex environment. We train our soldiers in combat tactical tasks and then we throw them in complex environments and we tell them, okay, but operate in a certain way. And we use it almost as a constraint instead of a way to enable us to maneuver better. And as a battalion commander at two in the morning, one night in Afghanistan, after a fight and a day long of negotiations, I found a sergeant out on guard duty all alone and he, and he was a great soldier and he told me, or he asked me, he said, sir, you like these people, don't you? And before I could answer, he said, I'm struggling because I have a hard time accepting them, seeing what they do to our soldiers. And I'm a religious man, and I love my family, and I love my hometown, so I'm not going to do anything that would dishonor them. And it really dawned on me at that point that this great soldier was struggling, that his values were eroding because of the environment we put him into. We trained him how to be a soldier, but yet we didn't train him. I did not train him enough to operate in this environment that he was now operating in. And I stood back and I reflected so much, and I realized that the most important piece of kit that we needed in this fight doesn't go on our IBA. It's our moral compass. And we approach our targets from that moral compass every single day, and we saw so many positive examples, and all these came from junior enlisted soldiers that taught me how we can uh, capitalize and gain advantage from our moral and value base. We are different, the American soldier. And, and the Afghans and Iraqis got to see this two examples. One, an ambush of a grenade hit our, our vehicle. Young soldier, after recovering from the shock, a grenade acquired the target, saw the person who threw the grenade, and in a split second elected not to shoot. There were too many children around, and the figure that he saw that threw the grenade was only about four and a half feet tall. It was a young boy. He was 11 years old. But by not acting that day, he acted decisively. We found that young man. We found his parents, and this soldier was able to meet him. And those parents and the rest of their tribe in their village are forever grateful that this young soldier knew right from wrong, and in a split second, he did it. And it's hard to train a soldier to do that. And then in Iraq this past time, we had an incident where myself and a mayor walking through town, we were throwing a grenade. Came very close. After recovering from the shock, I told the mayor, I guess you're not going to win re-election this town. But the young soldier was really having a hard time with it, and his sergeant picked up on it. And the soldier said, sir, I saw the man who threw it. I did not shoot back. And he felt that he had let us down and endangered his brigade commander's life. And I asked him why. And he said he was just right next to that store, and there was a whole, you know, about 20 Iraqis standing there just in shock at what had just happened. And he didn't think he had uh, a clear shot. He didn't shoot, and he thought he'd let us down. He thought he was a bad soldier. Well, when we introduced him to those people, those lucky Iraqis standing on that street corner that day that just did not get, uh, were not killed by collateral damage of U.S. soldier overreacting on the wrong target, it wasn't just the fact that he showed respect to them. It was the fact that he was a brigade commander, security detachment, elected not to fire. That's how important he valued Iraqi life. That was so valuable. Not because it was the right thing to do, but, but operationally that just catapulted us up and gave us so much respect over an enemy. An enemy couldn't counter that. An enemy could not expose a weakness of our, our values as a flank to exploit. It just didn't happen. 
Uh, and I think we just need to do more, because it, but every time I come back from deployment, it seems like we start over. We go back to the range, we go back to the lethal task, and we don't, we don't build this base on which we should be navigating from, our moral compass. And I think that is what uh, we need to learn. We need to take all these adaptations we have made over these last nine years of war, and we need to evolve better, grow from the strong roots of our past, but now be more decisive in the future. And two, two examples. One, I realized when I reset this last time as a brigade commander, I could track an M4 and a howitzer better than I could an individual soldier's reset. We didn't do enough for the individual soldier. We didn't break down the medical barriers and the chain of command barriers and connect them so we could have a holistic approach and assessment of that soldier's mental well-being because of privacy issues or stigma issues. That's nonsense. We are the best to care for them. We needed to be involved and we, we needed to get the right assets, change our organization so that we have nurse case managers at battalion level, family life consultants at the battalion level, dependency counselors at the battalion and company level to be available. We had AA meetings inside our headquarters on weekends, and we had senior leaders attending them. It's the reality of what we're in, but when they see that we are taking this approach and we're not just asking, does anyone got a problem? Okay, it's 1730, let's go ahead and have a safe weekend. You know what's gonna happen that weekend when you take that approach. But if you know your soldier, you can prevent it. And one of the most interesting things we started to do in Hawaii as I left was do a, uh, a study on the effects of mindfulness training on soldiers. We do PT every single day, and when we were younger, we did it quite well. But we understand the effects that physical fitness has on our bodies and our minds. But we don't train our minds. We inform our ranks, but we don't do enough with our, our minds, not just the uh, psychology behind it, but the physical aspects of increasing your brain capacity to deal with stressful, high-stress environments in, you know, in these, this complex battlefield that we fight on. We began a study, it was originally done with some Marines, but with a professor here at Georgetown University, Dr. Elizabeth Stanley, uh, her colleague now at the University of Miami, uh, neurologist, uh, Dr. Mishi Ja, and they tested 250 soldiers in the 3rd Brigade of 25th Infantry Division on mindfulness, mind-based training, uh, various levels of training to help soldiers increase their brain capacity to deal with stressful environments uh, and also increase attention span exactly what we need. We need to do that more than we need to zero our weapons to, to get in this kind of fight. And the neurologist then, after we did the study, they would test uh, the effects on the brain links, uh, brave, or your brain wavelengths uh, after this was done. This is science. So we need to follow the science a little bit more and, and do everything we can. We, if we care for our soldiers and families, no doubt. No institution does it better. But we can do more. And I would just urge us to follow the science on this because it's how we maneuver. We must develop the human in order to maneuver now in this, this environment that requires us to maneuver in human terrain. So that's really all I have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all to the panel for your powerful and compelling remarks and to General Kaslan for the outstanding overview he gave us of the campaign up front. In the TRADOC and CAC, we're uh, very excited about this learning campaign that we're launching. You, you've heard a lot of heartfelt remarks this morning, a lot of remarks about the core of who we are as an Army. General Kaslan opened us up and told us that we're looking at what does it mean for the Army to be a profession and what does it mean to be a professional soldier. And you heard much of that today from, from our panel remarks. We will continue this dialogue and hope that you all will take part in this dialogue with us. But it, it's, it's from the study of the profession that we will find the core of who we are as an Army. And it'll answer the hard questions like why the Army exists, who we serve, why we serve, what is our unique expertise, what is our culture, what is our ethic that explains why we fight and how we fight, what's our relationship with American people and their elected and appointed officials, how do we steward our profession? And what is the role of leadership? And these type of questions and many more are what we'll be tackling over this next year. And it ought to be a very exciting time for, for our United States Army as a, as a whole. So we will uh, be remaining in place for those that would like to stay and ask questions. But we realize many have to get off to the, to the luncheon. And please feel free to, to leave if you uh, would choose to do so. But let's give one more uh, round of applause, please, for General Caslin and the panel.